right, folks, welcome to the culture here on the White Star Network. I'm your host, Mawaji Muhammad. Thank you so much for tuning in, being a part of the conversation. Folks, we got a lot to talk about. First and foremost, we're going to talk about how in the state of Tennessee, one uh, elected official, a black elected official, decided to wear traditional African garb while taking care of business for the people. And he was told he needs to either change or leave the premises. Yeah, we said that. I'm asking the question, should elected officials be allowed to wear, you know, uh, cultural garbs while they're handling government business? We'll have that conversation. Also, we check in with the wealth whisperer, Alicia Holmes, to give us some insight about her five-day free online workshop that's building wealth and financial freedom for Black women and women of color. We'll have that conversation. And later on, the, the movie Till is being screened by the White House tomorrow. We're going to be checking in with Dr. Larry Walker to give us some indication of progress in race relations in America for the Biden administration. We'll have those conversations and, of course, want to hear from you. So stay with us. It's all happening on today's edition of The Culture right here on the Black Star Network. Let's go. Welcome to the culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad. Thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of the conversation. Folks, before we start, we want to invite you to make sure that you let all of your friends and family know that we are now streaming right now on Amazon News. So make sure you do your due diligence, letting them know that you can check us out on Fire TV right now. You can say, Alexa, play news from Black Star Network. And guess what? The culture will pop up, folks. We're on streaming on the platform 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And this is an opportunity to continue to have conversations about Black America and the rest of the country in a big, big way. So just let your friends and family know that we are now streaming on Amazon News. All right, folks, uh, we wanted to start with the conversation, the set of conversations today with something that I, I think that we should talk about, which is when is there an appropriate for you to express your culture, express your history? Now, this is being discussed right now in the Tennessee state uh, legislature because one Tennessee state representative decided to push the boundaries a little bit. Um, the Tennessee House GOP um, had told state representative Justin J. Pearson to explore a different career after wearing a daishiki on the house floor. Take a look at this, folks. This is interesting. They did not like the fact he's a freshman Democratic state representative, Justin Pearson. Um, they told him that GOP, they run the state of Tennessee. There's the brother right there. They told him either get in line or leave his position because he wanted to express Himself, he wanted to show he was for the culture. Now, um, he was a Route 100 honoree in 2022, and he wore the traditional West African garb in the chamber last week as he was being sworn in into the Tennessee General Assembly. Uh, according to the report, the GOP couldn't wait to comment on his attire. And shortly thereafter, he tweeted about it. Mr. Pearson, State Representative Pearson tweeted about it. He said, quote, we literally just got on the state floor. And already a white supremacist has attacked my wearing of my dashiki. Resistance and subversion to the status quo ought to make some people uncomfortable. Thank you to every black ancestor who made this opportunity possible. Now, the Tennessee House GOP, uh, they have uh, put out a tweet as well in response to that situation. Uh, they replied, quote, referencing the bipartisan and unanimously approved rules for House decorum, and dress attire is far from a racist attack. If you don't like rules, perhaps you should explore a different career opportunity. That's main purpose is not creating them. Ooh, there it is from the Tennessee House Republicans. Talking about his wearing a garb on the House floor for the state of Tennessee, folks. And it got me wondering, do you think the Tennessee GOP has a point 
or does State Representative Justin Pearson have a point? Pe uh, Pearson have a point. I want you to join me in a conversation. Post your comments as we're streaming right now live on YouTube, Facebook, Black Star Network. Post your comments in the chat, for folks, and let me know. Is Justin Pearson right on this one, or is this t Tennessee GOP? Now, I know some of you. <laughs> I already know some of you are already going to say, oh, no, the GOP, Tennessee? Nope. Nope, they're wrong. But I'm saying, let's think about this. Let's really think about this. Because there are rules and regulations on what you can wear and what's not appropriate, right? And based on that, can we... And, and it's like you wearing certain garbs to your job, to your job. And I know some of us, you know, we're really, really sticklers. So some of us may work as managers, supervisors, working in, in leadership roles at the job. What would you do? How would you advise? How would you handle this situation? Uh, here's a man who wants to express himself, a man who is proud of who he is and where he came from. And he wants to show that. And he also wants to make a political statement. And he wants to make a political statement. Is he in the wrong? Join us in the conversation. We'd love to hear what folks have to say uh, and, and so much more. And let me give you some more. And, and, and as, the, um, as your responses are coming through, I'm going to share with you a little bit more about this story. Um, so according to the Speaker of the House named Cameron Sexton, the baseline is for men to wear a suit and tie, but as speaker, he can change that rule. So when he was, the, when the speaker of the house, Cameron Sexton was asked by a local news station there in Tennessee, what he thought of it, he said, quote, the house clerk has sent representative Peterson the information he requested earlier today. During his historic tenure in the general assembly, the late Louis DeBerry established a precedent for a tire that remains in place today. Men must wear a coat and a tie if they wish to be recognized in committee or on the House floor. Ms. DeBerry would frequently address uh, members violating this precedent and remind them of the requirement. The Speaker will continue to follow the precedent and the path established by Ms. DeBerry to honor her and her incredible legacy within our legislative body. I'm gonna just let that sit right there. I'm gonna let you, I wanna get from you, crew. What do you think about this? All right, let me kick it off with my brother, Conscious Thought. Conscious Thought, thank you so much for checking in. Sir, you said this in response to the Tennessee GOP's attack regarding the wearing of the black representatives, uh, wearing of the daishiki. I personally take offense to the mandatory wearing of a suit and tie. Okay. Okay. But it is the government. It is the business of the people, right? So should we be upset about the mandatory wearing of suit and tie? Maybe it's not a suit and tie. Maybe it's maybe it's a, a, a open shirt, you know, unless there is some big moment. But government officials wear suit and ties. It's business. It's the business attire since you're handling the business of the people. Hmm. All right. Let me hear uh, Conscious Thought, my guy. Thank you for checking in. Chris, Chris B, you say any rule or law that's made that conflicts with the Constitution is invalid. Wow. However, the Constitution does not apply in the workplace as far as the Bill of Rights, right to privacy and expression. Right. I got you. Got you. Got you. Okay. So, Chris, let me make sure I'm understanding you here. Are you saying that Pearson is has the right to wear whatever he wants to wear? Are you saying that that's okay? I, I just want to make sure I'm getting you getting some clarity from you, bro, uh, so we can you know continue that part of the discussion. But I think you're bringing up a valid point. Thank you so much, uh, DeAndre. Checked in, DeAndre, my guy. You said, look, of course they didn't like that Faraji. That's akin to a foreign invasion to them. It's not professional or appropriate attire to wear in their eyes. That's true. But if there are already ground rules to this, right? If there are already ground rules that have been established before that, you know, Mr. Pearson got into office, shouldn't he be required to follow the rules? I'm just throwing some questions out there, folks, because I get it. 
But again, I'm going to go back to my initial point where some of us work in spaces where you can only wear a certain type of things. There are dress codes. We got dress codes for school. Uh, we got dress codes in a lot of different places. So wouldn't you want your representative, and I'm just throwing this question out there, wouldn't you want your representative to dress appropriately uh, because they're handling the business of the people? All right, let's go back to it. DeAndre, you also said, uh, uh, DeAndre, I appreciate you for, for, for pointing that out. My sister, Corinna, my sister, you can check her out on Fridays, folks. Corinna checked in and said, then why was cinema in a T-shirt, jean jacket, vest, and, ter- and tennis skirt? When was that? Just I, I may have missed that one. But Corinna, let me know. When did you see cinema in that? And and what was the context for that? Were they like handling, like what was the, what was going on for her uh, to wear T-shirt, jean jacket, vest, and tennis skirt? I'm, I'm interested. I'm interested. Corinna, appreciate you, sis. Thank you for checking in. I mean, I think that the, this is the part of the conversation, folks. It's like Justin Pearson, if he's he was on it, like I said, by the Route 100, he's a young black man. So he's coming from a different place culturally. He's also coming from a different place from a different generation where now you have more young people who are looking to express themselves, push back against certain type of rules and regulations and boundaries. And we love it. But we also kind of cringe on it. I know, I know, I know some older black folks cringe on it. I want to hear from some of the older black folks because I remember I have gone into spaces, right? Uh, for years, I would wear like a shirt and tie all the time in spaces because I was, because it was always told to me. And I, this is what I grew up thinking about, folks. It was always told when I was taking care of business, uh, when we were doing any type of organized work, I would wear a suit and tie. And people were blown away because, you know, you weren't walking around young people. And I was always say, well, you wear a suit and tie because I want them to see themselves as a certain way, you know, uh, more business, more professional. So I, I wore that not just because, you know, I enjoyed wearing that, but I felt like it was also my duty to kind of reflect a different part of the culture that they weren't used to seeing because the whole idea is opposites attract. Opposites attract, right? So I wore that, but I understand that in this day and time, this generation is different. If you're coming from the hip hop space, right? Hip hop, they don't wear suit and ties. They wear open shirts. They wear the the women wear certain things. You know, there's not always dresses. It's all, but it depends on the industry. It depends on the work that you do. Look, we got to take a quick pause. Conscious thought. I see you. You responded. Um, I, I want to share with you, or share with, with with folks what you have to say. And folks, let's continue to dialogue about this. Does is State Representative Justin Pearson is he wrong for wearing a daishiki on the House floor in the state of Tennessee, even though there are already rules and regulations on what men and women can wear while handling government business, while handling the people's business, or should he be allowed to just wear whatever he wants to wear? I want to get your take on it. Folks, we got to take a quick pause. When we come back, more of the conversation. Stay with us. We're just getting started here on The Culture on the Black Star Network. Black Star Network is here. A real uh, revolutionary right now. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America. All the momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? When you talk about Blackness, and what happens in black culture. We're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. 
We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind $100,000, so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to PO Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zell is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. All right, folks, welcome back to the show. We've been talking about the case of uh, State Representative Justin Pearson, who is a state representative in, his, in the state of Tennessee. He's a freshman representative, and he recently went on to the uh, state house uh, floor wearing a daishiki, and the uh, Tennessee GOP leadership told him, mm -mm, can't do that, sir. Can't rock a daishiki on the state floor, on the house floor. You either do that or you change your career if you want to make that type of statement ouch now he says that he's he refuses to back down and the, and, the, and the tennessee gop leadership is saying look this is as a result of a bipartisan agreement on what to wear when handling the people the the, the people's business while handling government affairs who is to blame who is to who is to change who is to who is right and who is wrong in the situation folks well, i want to hear from you Post your comments in the chat as we have this discussion. And I think it opens up a conversation about a lot of things. One is the, about where we are right now. Uh, Justin Peterson is a young black male. He's coming out of the hip hop space. He's also coming out of the space of social justice and activism. Look at him. There you go. My man is rocking the dashiki. He's rocking the Afro. So he's coming from a very, very pro-black Afrocentric space. And he's also an elected official. So can you can you be both? Can you can you walk the fine line of being for your people representing for the culture wearing certain garbs or should, you know can you you do you just acquiesce and say you know what I'm going to um just go back down to a suit and tie. Should the garb should elected officials be allowed to wear traditional cultural garbs while handling the people's affairs. That's the big question I'm asking you. Folks, all right, let me get back to you, you crew, and hear what you got to say. Uh, Corinna, you said um, that you can't recall when Kristen Cinema wore that T-shirt and jean jacket, but she was in the big chair on the Senate floor with the T-shirt and jean jacket vest. She had on a tennis skirt when she gave the thumbs down to the minimum wage bill. I don't know. I don't know what's, what was going on with that. Corinna. I, I really don't know what happened. I don't, I didn't see that moment, but that sounds crazy. <laughs> that just sounds crazy to me. So I'm not sure what was going on. What was going on? If anyone else in the crew knows about that moment, please let me know because that just sounds wild that she's voting and all of that in this. I don't know. I don't know. And here's the thing, folks. Do you want your government official? And again, I'm, I'm not talking about if they're out in the community. I'm not talking about if they're, you know, part of a some type of gathering, some type of parade or something. I'm talking about handling the business in the state house, stay in the in the White House. Would you want your government officials to wear whatever they want to wear, or do you want them to come to to the state house or the White House in a very professional, quote unquote, professional manner? Or doesn't or it doesn't matter to you? Uh, Janelle, my sister, you say cinema wears the wildest stuff all the time. <laughs> During orientation, it was probably a discussion about dress code. If so, then he was being defiant and inappropriate. If not, then no. Well, you don't know. Like, I don't know. And that's a great point. You don't know whether he was told this beforehand and he was like, all right, bump it. I'm just going to wear what I want to wear. Or it was like he never seen the rules and regulations and thought. But here's here's the thing though, he's not slow. He's not slow. You know what I mean? Like like when you wear dashikis, when you wear any type of cultural garb, especially as black elected officials, you know it's going to ruffle some feathers. You know what I'm saying? People have literally died for less. You know what I mean? So you know that. And I'm I'm not saying that to to throw shade on the brother. I'm just making a point that he he knew that it was whether it's appropriate or not. It's a political statement. It's always been a political statement. How many times have we seen 
uh, uh, um, any elected official, uh, community organizers, activists, some of our great heroes and sheroes who have come and stepped up in government places with full garb on. From, you know, Black Panthers, they used to come into without even without talking about the guns. They had the leather jackets and the, and the, and the berets. And that was a revolutionary style. That was the attire at that moment. Right. And that was like to let folks know, like, this is this is who we are. What you wear speaks volumes about how you think and who you are. Uh, so it's a great point, you know, we don't we may not know the answers to whether he knew before or after, but. It's a great point. Thank you for checking in. Uh, Janae checked in. You said, just imagine if someone wore locks, they would ban that person too. It's beyond ridiculous. The GOP is trash. Yeah, I probably wouldn't get in, Jan Janae. <laughs> and look at me like, what's your name? Muhammad. And you were like, oh, no, sir. No, sir. I'll be like, I'm here to testify. <laughs> From home, <laughs> we'll bring you on a virtual chat. Uh, yeah. Pretty much. It, it, it could be. But again, here's the thing. Do we want to push the emphasis? Do we really want to? Uh, um, is that something that we should be calling for to change? And again, I know that there are older folks who are like, no, that's not appropriate. We could be pro-black, but you could still wear a suit and tie. I know it is. Tiana, uh, Janae, thank you so much. Uh, Tiana, you checked in and said, look, I'm so sick of the culture wars. State Representative Pearson should be able to wear a dashiki. Boom, it is. There it is. Um, Danny Lee, you checked in. You said dashikis can't be worn formally. I do have a comment about Representative Camper. I'm not sure why she was, all, uh, she was defending and standing with GOP traditions. That is why we can't move forward. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure either. Great point though. Uh, Keenan, my man, Keenan got the, uh, let me, hey, Keenan, let's, let's show the, 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 the photo of, of Kristen Cinema wearing with, with the thumbs down. If we can pull that one up for me, bro. There we go. I don't know what the hell is going on there. What is that? What is she doing? Kristen Cinema, boy, she, she a special individual folks. <laughs> That's all I can say. I, I don't know what is going on. I really don't know what is going on. Looks like she just stopped by after like running some errands or something. I'm not sure what is going on here. Mm. I, hey, Corinna, I don't know. I have no idea what's going on with that. It doesn't look like there was a, a major decision, like there was a huge vote on the floor the way it's set up, but I can't tell. I cannot tell. But even that, the fact is, it still got people talking, right? Because it's it's not considered to be the normal, appropriate thing. If somebody took a picture of her wearing that stuff with her thumbs down, it's just, it's still a it's still it's still the point of she's kind of out of order. Pauline, you checked in. Good to hear from you. You said, why don't they stick to the people's business and stop worrying about what we are wearing? Well. Again, I'm, I'm asking folks, if you saw, and I get it, I'm, I'm, I'm posing questions for both sides, right? Because I'm going to be honest, like, I'm, I'm just trying to think like, okay, do I want my representative to wear a t-shirt and jeans, right? And it's fine. Like, there's always the talk about representation. But when you are a public official, you're not just representing yourself. You're representing your constituents, and especially for black elected officials. I think I hope black folks understand this. I hope we all understand it. Like black folks, we have a different standard. Folks, let's get out of our minds that there that we get so shocked that there's a double standard. Like we've been in this country for over 400 plus years. Of course, there's a double standard. Y'all gonna make me shake my locks or crazy. Of course, there's a double standard, folks. But here's the other thing. Are you just representing yourself or are you representing the best of your constituents? And what does the best of your constituents look like? There we go. Sister Karen, my sister Karen, you checked in and said, I love cultural dress. However, when you are employed and paid by someone else, you dress 
as the employer requires, the dress code should be followed by all cultures. Here's the thing. Now, again, Karen, I think, thank you for mentioning that because the sometimes the conversation can get real crazy because we're talking about GOP, we're talking about the culture wars and whatnot. What if the Democrats had said something to Justin Peters, to Justin Pearson, and said, please don't wear that? What would have what would have happened if that was the case? But I'm with you there, Karen. That if you 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 signed up, see when we sign up for jobs, when we get certain roles and positions, we we signing up for everything. We're signing up that we're going to be we're going to follow their rules. We're signing on for the fact that uh 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 we're going to be a representative of that institution of that company, right? We're signing up for, I mean, we're signing on all of these things. It's not just like, oh, I get a job and I get to do what the hell I want to. No, you sign on the how you use your time, what time you come in, what time you clock out, when you have your lunch, if you have that type of job. You sign on, I mean, you sign in for working on weekends, you're working on nights, working on holidays. You sign up for this. You can't sign on for something and be like, man, I ain't doing this. I ain't doing that. I ain't doing I know what that's culturally, that's how we like to do. Man, they got me working on weekends. Well, you should have known. <laughs> That your job requires you to work on weekends. <laughs> so you're absolutely right. I think that's the part. Is it about the rules or is it about the the, the personalities and the, and the emotions behind the personality? Because again, say it was black people that said to him, hey, Justin, bro, I understand you, brother. You're just coming in. But here, we like to represent in a suit and tie. Would you be mad? He might have had that conversation with some older black men in the state legislature down in Tennessee. But would you be mad for pulling him up about it? I don't know. Uh, Damon, my brother, you say I'm one of the older ones in the culture crew. I have no problem of him wearing a dashiki. With that, they make these rules to keep us from wearing these cultural items and et cetera. I get it. I get it. I get it. And I know, uh, Damon, you are an engineer. I don't know what type of dress code. Um, is required for the spaces that you're in. But I'm sure you talk to your son, your 18-year-old your son, tell him about rules and regulations and dress codes, and that if he decides to step outside of those things, right, then be, be prepared for the consequences. Like, it's okay, fine. You want to push the envelope? That's certainly fine. Just know that there are going to be some consequences for your actions. So that's the other thing. Uh, just to throw out there another in another situation as it relates to this, the lawmakers in the Missouri House of Representatives in January, they adopted a stricter dress code for women as part of a new rules package. And now requires them to uh, cover their shoulders by wearing a jacket like a blazer, a cardigan, knit blazer. Uh, this is something that's, that, that CNN reported on. But the this they have a dress code package because. I, I bet you it's coming out of a space where people felt feel like their individuality is being denied, right? And that's the that's often what we find ourselves, right? A lot of times we we push back on rules and regulations because we don't want to. We feel like, look, this is my individual expression. This is who I am. All of those things. But again, folks, again, when you come in, you gotta you gotta figure out whether that's the situation. That's the situation. Look, I got to take a quick pause. I appreciate y'all for checking in and being a part of the conversation. Hopefully, and I'm going to keep my eyes on this. I wonder how they're going to play this thing out. Are they going to revise the rules for the dress code or what? We will have to see. Look, I got to take a quick pause. When we come forward, we're going to have our sister Alicia Holmes to check in to talk about how she is doing her part to getting Black women in particular uh, in a space of financial freedom and so much more. We'll be checking in with the wealth whisperer herself, Alicia Holmes. So stay with us. That conversation comes up next here on The Culture, only on the Black Star Network. hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. 
angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Black Star Network is here. Oh, no punch! It's a real um, revolutionary right now. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America. All the momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? All right, folks, welcome back to the show. Uh, our next conversation is with the Wealth Whisperer herself, Miss Alicia Holmes, and she's going to talk to us about an opportunity for women of color to take advantage of where they can possibly work, go into a space of financial freedom, folks. And I'm very, very excited to have my sister back on. So let's welcome now the Wealth Whisperer, Alicia Holmes. Alicia, thank you so much for joining me again here on The Culture. How are you this afternoon? I'm, I'm great. I had so much fun the last time I was here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate it. Hey, Alicia, all right, let me, before we jump into this, I, I, I'm, I'm interested to get your take. Okay. We had the segment, this is the first segment, talking about wearing daishikis on the House floor on government spaces. Mm -hmm. You actually work in, um, not only are you uh, a financial um, wealth building expert, but you also do business coaching and you, you work with a lot of different women in, mm -hmm. in small and big companies. What, what What's your take on it, especially now, given there is a, an emergence of individual mm -hmm. expression and mm -hmm. cultural expression from black and, and brown folks in this country. Yeah, you know, this is a very nuanced conversation and um, I was listening in. I don't know much about it. I'm, I've been, I go on a, what I call news fast. Sometimes. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> to get my head but it's just essentially a black, young black man, mm -hmm. wore daishiki. He's a state representative in the state of Tennessee. Okay. And the, he's a Democrat. The Republicans okay. are saying, you can't wear dashiki while on the state house floor while handling government business. We have a dress code. We have rules and regulations. Now, if you want to push back on all these rules and regulations that were established in a bipartisan manner, mm -hmm. then you might need to find yourself a different career. Hmm. Okay. So just from a cursory <laughs> perspective, I don't yeah. know the whole, uh, yeah, from a cursory I get you. I get you. perspective, um, if there is a dress code and there's not some um, gender or cultural um, biases in that dress code, yeah. and it is standardized for everyone, I think it's legit to have dress codes. Um, yeah. But how much of this is influenced by gendered or racial um, um, biases in what you, uh, what you consider to be appropriate. And so um, when I look at things like the, this, I like to go a little deeper and say, okay, what is this dress code even about? Yeah. Why does it exist? Is right. it here to uh, standardize things in a way so that people's dress are not a distraction from you know the larger issues and uh, what we need to pay attention to here? 
or should there even be more diversity in how, what we consider a appropriate code of dress? Because maybe it comes from standards and its history is full of biases. So from a cursory perspective, I need to know a little more. That would be my take on it. I also like, I always like to dig a little deeper into like, what is this code and that's, about? And that's a, that's a very mature way of looking at it. And folks, I will tell you that uh, we did post a, a poll on our YouTube chat that you can join in. We asked the question, was state representative Justin Pearson dashiki inappropriate? So mm -hmm. as we have the show and have different conversations, definitely check us out in the poll and we'll share those results at the end. But I I'm glad that you mentioned that because it requires us to think, mm -hmm. think a little bit deeper. And one of the things that Alicia, is I know that the work that you're doing is, is getting us into spaces, right? Mm -hmm. Where we are, we are more strategic um, about getting into certain spaces, whether it's in the business space, whether it's school, whether it's government. Mm -hmm. Like we, 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 there has to be some strategy on how to get there, right? Absolutely. And I think one of the big things, especially for the next generation, mm -hmm. that you know, I feel like I'm, I can serve as a bridge for, and I've always thought this, like, okay, I'm not this age, but I'm not this age, so I'm like in between. Right. Is that helping young people to 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 refine their strategy mm -hmm. to get the Absolutely. maximum result, to get the best the best thing that, that out of the situation, right? And mm -hmm. I feel like that's part of the work that you're doing, right? Absolutely. You know what I mean? There's a there's a strategy on wealth building, there's mm -hmm. a strategy on establishing business and getting to a level of financial freedom, mm -hmm. but sometimes you know, we just like to jump to the end. You know what I mean? Get to the end of the story, Alicia. Let's get to the end. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, okay. No. You want me to save and all that stuff and change my behavior, <laughs> change my behavior but when am I going to get $10,000 at the end of the month? <laughs> okay. No, we want to go way past 10K. We want to build businesses that are trillion dollar businesses that setting up the future of where things are going in this industrial revolution. We want to be creating that. We want our children to see mm -hmm. themselves as builders and creators in this fifth industrial revolution where we are right now. I'm so glad, so glad you started here. Um, there's so much, there's so, we're in a very interesting time. We know we're in this recession, but we're also at the beginning of this fifth industrial revolution. If we're paying attention to what's happening right now with artificial intelligence, um, quantum computing, digital currency, and we can't even call it digital currency because it really is currency now sitting on the blockchain, which is really programmable money that you can actually set rules around, which, which is a whole different world and dynamic, which is literally what cryptocurrency is. But we're talking about everything, healthcare, education, agriculture, transportation, everything is changing and changing rapidly. And you started this with talking about our children, our, our children being prepared to be the ones building and shaping this world, this shifting world that we're living in right now. Um, and that's, mm -hmm. that's a big question. Mm hmm I mean, I have a nine-year-old and I have a three-year-old, Alicia. Mm -hmm. And every day, mm -hmm. you know, I think about what the world is going to look like in the next five years and what the mm -hmm. world is going to look like in the next 10 years once my son gets of age to do certain things, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that that's, that's I, I think that's the, that's the hard part, especially if you are a Black parent. Right. Right. If you have black children or if you have black, if you're a black grandmother, black grandfather, or you taking care of some babies or some young adults. Right. Absolutely. That's 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 I think that's a that's like at the top of mind for a lot of folks in this country. It's like what what world am I? What world should we expect? You know what I am saying right now yes, is we need to be shaping this world. We need to be involved in understanding and learning. And just as an aside, you know, I have two grown daughters and for a time period, 
um, when they were young, they were very young. Um, I had them in a in kind of elite private schools. And the way children interacted with technology and the, the way that they were encouraged to interact with the technology was so different. They were not just like passive users of it. They were all, they were, it was an environment that was always encouraging them, creating all kinds of tools and initiatives. And I saw some of the things that, you know, that they did that came out of that environment. Um, that's a little bit of an as aside, but it's a different mindset to see yourself as the person who I'm understanding this, I'm building it and I'm shaping it. And I'm a real proponent right now for us seeing ourselves doing just that. And I know in some ways, like this is a, a bigger conversation, but I wanna share that during um, COVID in 2020, when COVID hit, I'm very interested in innovation. I've been looking at it for decades when I was you know, in my early twenties and investing in it and the way it shapes our lives. So I started an innovation investing study group and we all read a book called um, The Future is Faster Than You Think. And I had as many as 120 women coming every week reading this book. And then I said, you know, I'm not doing all the work and they had to do presentations mm. on the future of education, the future of healthcare, artificial and augmented reality, uh, the metaverse. I mean, this was in 2020 when people had time on their hands and the way everyone was being so expansive. When I said I wasn't doing all the work, they had to do presentations. So I have like, I don't know how many presentations every week, another woman that was just researching and you know, we're brilliant when we attack something. Right, right, right. And the effect that that has on the conversation with their children grandchildren, there was some grandmas in there who were doing amazing work um, with their children, their grandchildren, the conversations with their communities. A lot of these women really got opened up to uh, Web3 um, and are playing very powerfully in, uh, in the space with setting up decentralized autonomous organizations and NFTs and uh, cryptocurrency and all of those things. And what I love about it is like I'm talking to women who like smart, work hard, come home every day, have children. Like, you know, I feel like very often like women and particularly women of color, it just ignored. Nobody is talking to us about these things and saying, this is important for you to know. And like just expanded, you know, are now having new job careers, um, going to events they never saw. Uh, conferences all over the world because of this. And so um, first we have to start with ourselves and, and expand and then expand with our children, the people close to us and around us and our communities, because yeah. uh, I read this and I want to say this, um, that right now the biggest shift in generational wealth in history is being made right now by understanding some of the things that I'm talking about right now. We have to understand uh, artificial intelligence, what impact that is having. You know, the robots who are being powered by artificial intelligence, who are taking over all kinds of jobs. And then we have like chat GPT and then Google is coming out with its own version. And the capacity, if you play with this stuff, what you can do and create and the brilliance, well, the information yeah. um, that is coming out of it and, you know, the future predictions, uh, this artificial intelligence being able to do just everything that right. a human can do. So I, I can't stress enough that we is early enough still for us to see ourselves, like, let me learn more about this. Let me sit at the door. Let me be in conversation. Um, what kind of future and jobs, like, you know, uh, software engineers and now uh, developers, engineers are making a million dollars a year. I know a kid personally who's a friend of my daughter's that are literally, this is, this is, this is how valuable these skills are. Are our children being prepared to be a part of shaping that? Are we prepared? 
Are we mm. having conversations? Are we understanding what's happening right now? Lisa, uh, let me let me let me let me let me put you on pause mm-hmm. because we got to take a quick pause. But when we come mm-hmm. forward, I want us to kind of delve a little deeper in that. And and I do have a couple of questions about that, mm-hmm. um, especially when we're seeing there's so much advancement on the technology side in the scientific space. Um, there's so much advancements in terms of innovation, mm-hmm. but then yet when we're looking at uh, when we're looking at the human being, I'm talking about how we think, how we behave. The the the, the you know. When we're looking at, when we study human behavior, decision-making, the science and art and skill of understanding the, those social sciences, right, as it relates to mm-hmm. as much as there is all of these advancements, there's something that is holding us back as human beings where we are fundamentally are, you know, uh, are suffering from some sort of, um, um, you know, as they call it, you know, a- aberrations, or mm-hmm. aberrations where we're still not mentally seeing each other as human beings we can we can relate better to technology than we can to other human beings so there's a lot of conversation about how do we prepare our children and ourselves for this vast fast growth while at the same time staying human and understanding the humanity of other people so there's the, I want us to kind of dig deep. I got the answer. I, got the answer. I know we got to take a break. <laughs> All right, I got to take a quick pause. Checking in with the Wealth Whisperer, Alicia Holmes. We're going to talk about that and a whole lot more. She got a five-day free workshop uh, that is going to be happening for women of color, for financial freedom folks. We got a lot to talk about. So stay with us. It's the culture here on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. Black Star Network is here. Oh, no punch! I'm a real um, revolutionary right now. I thank you for being the voice of Black America. All the momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? All right, folks, welcome back. We have been talking to the wealth whisperer, Miss Alicia Holmes, as she's been giving us some insight and serving a laying out the foundation for financial freedom and why it's important that women of color and men of across the country and around the world, why we are in a better how why it's important for us to get into a better space, not just with our finances, but also with how we see each other. And of course, with the big ideas as we are in the age of information. And she's going to talk to us about uh, an opportunity, a five-day opportunity that she's hosting and presenting as part of the solution. So I'm going to bring her back into the frame, Alicia. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. But you were, you were kind of, now you, 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 you really, you're really touching my heart and my spirit right now, Alicia. <laughs> because you're talking about things in terms of preparation or preparing our children for this, this future right? Mm-hmm. This very real future where technology has, is, is, is moving forward. Mm-hmm. Um, there are a lot of innovations in various spaces. Mm-hmm. And so you're asking a very pivotal question, will we be prepared? My mm-hmm. only, my only, one of the big concerns that I have is that we can, we are living in a time and in a space and in a culture where things are moving way fast. Like, you know, everything that we, we thought was is no longer is that type of thing, right? Mm-hmm. 
but the, everything is moving fast except the development of the human being. So it seems like it seems like we're getting, and I'm saying as human beings seeing each other's humanity, mm -hmm. um, being compassionate, mm -hmm. the, the 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 fundamentals of what it means to be a human being is slowly being diminished or being overlooked. It's it's all about oh what's on the outside of us. But what about during the great work? What about the growth and the cultivation of us on the inside? So that way, when we get, you know, our hands or when we are exposed to technology, we don't use those things for nefarious purposes. It's like, like, how do we grow in that space as well? I'm fine with technology growing. We in AI, metaverse, we got all of these different innovations. But if you have a messed up human being who is designing these products or you have a messed up human being that is using these products to take advantage of other human beings, then is it really a technological benefit? Is it a scientific breakthrough when human beings are still being denied their own humanity? Okay. So there's so much I could say to this. But... I know. <laughs> what were you just talking <laughs> this is talking. No, I'm saying it's like dude, this is yeah. talking. This is part of the culture, right? Because right. we often we're, we're in a time where people are looking looking for stuff on the outside, and it's like we may have to slow down a little bit. Like, yeah, the world is moving faster, mm -hmm. but as black folks and as brown folks, as folks that are who whose whose roots are in mm -hmm. who are who roots who roots are in nature, who are rooted in the universe, like that's not the pace that we should be working at. Or I don't think we should be working at, right? Mm -hmm. Like we can't keep up with that pace because we're denying ourselves in the process or rather negating ourselves in the process. Oh my God, you always leave so many things just rushing through my head about everything. I know, <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> so one of the things I would say is we can't see ourselves as passively just receiving all of this technology that we feel that is lacking the humanity that we'd like to see as a part of the technology. So when I say that we need to be a part of shaping it, technology doesn't have to look the way it looks. Right now, it's being designed by very few people with a lot of power. And the thing about this industrial revolution is that there are not a whole lot of barriers to entry that they were in other industrial revolutions. And every industrial revolution has some conversation about things are moving too fast, what's gonna to happen to all of the ways that things happened in the past. But you know what? You move forward, things change and then you set up rules based upon those changes so mm -hmm. you know the invent of um of automobiles and um you know that put the horse and buggy out of business and you know and people were like you know the exercise uh the telephone how that you know put uh couriers of the time out of business and you know and then you had once these things were in place you created new dynamics around it. So what I wanna say right now in the fifth industrial revolution, that's what we're in. There are very few people shaping it. We act like we are passively, we have to passively receive these technologies. No, we get to get in there and be the engineers and be the designers and have our children see themselves as, mm -hmm. oh, we're gonna be the engineers the designers, the creators of new ecosystems that will shape it. But how do we get there? So so that it's not going in the direction. If we don't like the direction it's going to, yeah. we have to be more involved. So how do we get there? First, it's a mindset shift. And that mindset, sh that mindset shift looks like us seeing our own power here and us understanding we're in the information age and knowledge is power like never before right those ladies when we were looking reading that book and looking at what's happening in biotech 
when we were looking at flying cars and we're looking at 3D printing of homes and, you know, we could be strategically thinking about our input, the companies we can build that will change the outcomes for our community and give access to our children and all of those things. And so it starts with fundamentally a mindset shift which is why I have the program that I have coming up and I'll talk about that. And we'll talk about that in a minute because yes. I, I, I'm glad that you bring that up. It's mm -hmm. a mindset shift mm -hmm. that is going to be required by parents and children, by all of us, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But you got a lot of people that are pushing back on this, man, because as much as we've been, we, we can talk about the future is now, we've also been conditioned to believe that the future is in someone else's hands. Yes. And, it's and I'm going to talk about it. I got to take another pause, but when we come back, <laughs> it's I want us to talk about it. Folks, stay okay. with us. We still got a lot more. We're chopping it up with the Wealth Whisperer, Alicia mm -hmm. Holmes. And of course, with mm -hmm. you, post your comments in the chat. And let's continue to have the conversation right here on The Culture on the Black Star Network. I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show, Get Wealthy, focuses on the things that your financial advisor and bank isn't telling you, but you absolutely need to know. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. Black Star Network is here. A real uh, revolutionary right now. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America. All the momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, there's a difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? All right, folks, welcome back. We've been talking to Alicia Holmes, who is a, uh, a wellness expert. She's the wealth whisperer, and she's putting together an opportunity for, for women of color, for, for black women, women from various communities to, to, to embark upon. This is a five-day challenge that she's putting out there. Uh, and we're going to talk to her a little bit more about this opportunity called Seducing Abundance on Your Journey to wealth, a five-day challenge to propel women of color into a world of self-discovery and financial freedom. And let me just say, folks, I enjoy having conversations like this, especially with my sister Alicia, because we tend to believe that stuff is on the outside, that we're going to change our money behavior, our spending habits, and all of those things. That's what's going to naturally change, like it's, like it's just going to happen overnight based on some magic genie. But it's about a mindset. And Alicia, that's the point that you brought up. It is really about a mindset. There has to be a shift in mindset. And, and as I'm listening to you, sis, and I appreciate you for, for being big in your thinking. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm serious, right? Because we can have conversations about, okay, make sure you put some savings away. Make sure you, you, you know what I mean? If you want to invest in a 401k. I mean, you know, a lot, and look, let me tell you. The folks that watch this show, my culture crew, they are highly intelligent people. These are, you know, they're scholars and professors and engineers. These are professional people. These are, we got folks that work in various industries watching this show. So they've heard that. We all heard this stuff. The thing that, the reason that you're in business is because, not because of, we don't know how to create a savings account. Mm -hmm. But the reason is because what is the thinking that goes along with creating the savings account? Or what is the thinking? Like, what is your vision? What is your plan? Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we're talking about, like, financial planners like yourself and others. That's where y'all help us to fill in the gap, right? Mm -hmm. Because there are so many competing interests on mm -hmm. our time and our money, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That at the end of the day, it's like, 
you know, you get a lump sum of money, and next thing you know, you just all of a sudden bills, 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 this happening, this happened. I gotta, I gotta put out this financial fire, this financial fire, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and you're not thinking about the longevity of the moment. You're not thinking mm -hmm. about all of these, you know, you're not thinking about the economy mm -hmm. of ideas. <laughs> 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 I mean, that's where we in. You started mm -hmm. off this conversation saying mm -hmm. we need to be creators. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. I remember I just recently was reading, doing some reading, Alicia, and they say in this age of information, as you call it, the fifth industrial revolution, mm -hmm. currency right now is not the little paper notes that we got. Mm -hmm. The real currency is the currency of ideas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Like, 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 I mean, that's the currency we own. And, 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 and this is why I think it's important for us to have this conversation the way we're having, because yeah. they're attacking, and I'm saying they, and this could be whether, I'm not just talking about white people, I'm talking about anybody that mm -hmm. is um, closing out the light of truth in this day and time. That could be black or white people. Mm -hmm. Anybody that is in the, in the, uh, that is trying to keep us in a dumbed down mm -hmm. position, right? Mm -hmm. They always want us to be watching somebody else instead of thinking about ourselves. Mm -hmm. They always want us to be focused of spending some our money with somebody else instead of investing in ourselves. Mm -hmm. Like if that's the time that we're living in, and that's why we're seeing the situation we see with the school systems, there's mm -hmm. an uprising, there's a revolt that's happening in that space. We're mm -hmm. seeing the revolt that's happening in the mm -hmm. business space where you see more black women have started businesses since mm -hmm. the pandemic started than any other group of people in Absolutely. this country. Mm -hmm. um, all of these things are happening because I think essentially people are trying to figure out like, how do I become a more productive human being? Mm -hmm. And how do I make sure that I'm producing children that mm -hmm. have the ideas to produce the future that we want them to have? Am I, am I on the right track here, Alicia? No, absolutely. And, you know, I do want to go back to you talked about uh, the inner work. So yeah. I'm very holistic in my approach to this because I know that uh, I have a friend who says the inner work makes the outer work. And so mm -hmm. you'll see for my event, it says self-discovery. Because now more than ever, uh, we need to do the inner work so that anything, uh, these conversations about lack uh, and uh, limited beliefs at all, we need to get that stuff out of the way so we can play a more powerful game. Because if there was ever a time in history where we can enter, play, and win, and create ecosystems and uh, economic ecosystems, uh, strategies, and uh, te use technology in ways that really could shape opportunities that were thought of before for our communities, the time is now. But really and truly, it's about doing the inner work. You know, one of the first things I do, you know, I have a boot camp roadmap to uh, like an abundant mindset and then the, um, the tactics and tools in our culture, what you need to know in order to be, to build wealth. But most of the work is the mindset work well, uh, work, it is like how you feel about yourself. And there's a lot that we get as people of color, as black and brown people, as black and brown women, as black and brown children, that we re really need to disrupt those conversations first and foremost. So right. Something like have Heal Your Relationship with Money. It's a great book that I have. It's 28 Days of Journaling. Like, wait, wait, What's the book called again, Alicia? It's called Heal Your Relationship with Money by Cara Stevens. I, she know, I wow. spoke to her on the phone. I'm like, your book, like I use it all the time. I have women do these 28 days of journaling so they can have the stuff that needs to come up, come up, out, work on it and, and deal with it. I work with another sister, um, Shawnee uh, Gibson who also has a, a, something called Be the Tree. It is a like a rites of passage for women, uh, mostly women of color. And like the women who do her program, when they come, they're really ready. Now they're ready 
to get rid of to, you know, all of the limiting beliefs and what's possible because we pass that stuff on to our children. And culturally, no group has been systemically institutional, uh, institutionally um, challenged as we have. And that has affected us. And we need to clean a lot of that stuff away. And now more than ever, because we have the opportunity in this fifth industrial revolution to build, build, build in ways that can change our lives. Now, it's hard to wrap your head around this, which is why I started that study group in 2020, because everybody left so expanded. But what I can leave you with about that is, you know, do your research. You, let's use our screen time powerfully um, to understand this. There's someone I follow on Instagram and I saw him speak at the Black Women Talk Tech conference. I, I, it's called the tall guy. The tall guy, I, I, I can't think of his whole name. And <laughs> follow him on Instagram because he is dropping so much knowledge and science. Like I have resources and I, I wanna share those resources with people because these are, all important for us to grow um, and develop. And we have to do that uh, inner work. You know, I'm doing my inner work. I'm meditating. I find some of the, the scientists who are playing with quantum physics and, and explaining certain phys, uh, um, spiritual, what we consider spiritual pheno uh, uh, phenomenon. I follow Joe Dispenza's work. I think the way he's using science to explain uh, how we actually are creators and shape the world that we have in front of us and, and it's giving us access back to our power. Like, you know, study, like this is the time to just get the information that you need to be able to make good choices for yourself, for your children, for your family and for generations to come. Big, big, big moment. All right, I want to make sure we get some, um, we got a couple of moments left in this part of the segment, but I want to make sure we do put out some of the, the logistics around this five-day challenge. And mm -hmm. folks, I want you to join us in a conversation, please. I know that some of you are taking in this information and just kind of feeding on it, but join us and share your thoughts and your comments with us, post in the chat on YouTube, especially um, and on Facebook and on Black Star Network as we have this conversation with Alicia. But let's talk about this five day challenge. What was the what was the inspiration? See, I could talk to you all day, Alicia. That's a damn problem. <laughs> Next so, thing you know, me and you would be going out in space. <laughs> yes. Coming back down and pick a couple of people up, go right back out. <laughs> yes, I'm very interested in that. <laughs> oh my God. It's so, talking yeah. about this five day challenge of seducing of uh, abundance. So, you know, I really wanted to get into like, uh, you know, that field for women of desires and pulling abundance in, not like from, from the masculine penetrating, penetrating, but having it um, uh, receiving, being receptive. Um, and so this challenge, you know, over the years, I have met phenomenal women doing amazing work in the world. Many are so successful, but so, and so heart-centered. And so I curated some women to come and speak to other women about all of it. So the first day, I, the first three days, I call setting the fertile ground for abundance. And so the first day I have a uh, uh, great speaker, uh, um, Hazel Ortega, who wrote From Bounce Checks to Private Jets, telling her story. Uh, she, she is the mastery of miracles. And she's such an inspiration about dreaming big, manifesting. It's all possible for you, no matter where you came from. Uh, and she's speaking with uh, Jay Nicole, who is like, Black women, let's do it. Let's manifest and live our big dreams and live our lives. And then I go on the second day to talk about self-care. That's a big issue for us as women of color, like taking care of ourselves. We take care of so many people and the women I have speaking, it's not talking about it on some cursory level. I'm talking about on a real deep level. What do we do as women to really take care of ourselves so we can take care of others? 
And then the third day, I have a conversation about the power of sisterhood and community and building together and how that strengthens entire communities and entire families and how important that is. Um, and I have uh, two amazing women, um, Shawnee again, Gibson. I have uh, Kira um, from the, char uh, the Traveling Diaries tour who literally during COVID decided to do a traveling diary to take diaries, have women write their heartfelt sharing on three pages, make a copy, pass it on to the next woman. Now is in over 30 countries and women are really from on a ground level, like sharing with each other and how the power of that. And then on day four and five is when I really get into investing. Two amazing women talking about what is the fifth industrial revolution? They could talk about it like no one else, why women need to participate, why we need to invest in it, and why we need to build in it. Uh, um, uh, Jitali Bellaton, who is a dear friend of mine also, uh, and Shalita Burke. And if you, if you look at either one of these women and what they're doing in the world so powerfully, sisters, powerfully investing, building in this world. And then on Friday, I have... Um, uh, a sister talking about uh, venture capitalists precede funding, getting in early, understanding she's focused on com com uh, companies that are building out the future. As women very often, like being a, in, investing that early in companies, mm -hmm. what does that even look like? We're not even in a conversation. And then I have uh, Mina Black talking about all of the different options and ways we can invest. You think when something goes on Broadway, there's not investors? How about investing in theater, art, collectibles, all of the ways that we can invest, um, real estate initiatives. Uh, these four women who are talking about investing are some powerful women and powerful investors. And I just wanted to bring everybody together. Right. Fertile ground, investing. The women who are talking about fertile ground are are very much very successful entrepreneurs themselves and just bring women together to be in a powerful conversation. Because remember, the biggest shift in generational wealth in history is happening now from the choices that we're made making right now to be in this conversation. We're in many conversations. Let's be in this one. That's absolutely facts. Absolute facts. All right, we got to take a quick pause. When we come forward, more conversation with the wealth whisperer, Alicia Holmes, and of course with you. Stay with us. It's the culture here on the Black Star Network. Black Star Network is here. Punch. A real uh, revolutionary right now. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America. All the momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? When you talk about Blackness, and what happens in black culture. We're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to PO Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037- 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com.
Folks, welcome back to the show. We've been having a very, very insightful conversation with the wealth whisperer, Alicia Holmes, who is talking about how we can seduce abundance. And this is part of her, her, uh, her, her work of creating a five-day free online set of workshops. Here it is, to propel women of color into a world of self-discovery and financial freedoms. And if you've been listening to Alicia you can hear that it's just not about dollars and cents, folks. It's about how we think. It's about the environment and the space that we find ourselves in. It's about the culture and how to maximize not just our wallets and our and our profits, but it's about how to maximize our productivity, how to maximize our thinking. And I want to, we got a few more minutes left with Alicia this afternoon. And I'm so, so grateful for my sister for coming on and talking about the you know the work that she's doing because there's a couple of folks my in my in the crew that are like my sister Lana, one of our uh, loyal watchers. She said, "Sister is connecting physics and spirit into the conversation about money." And a lot of black women, and I'm seeing on the chat, are saying like, "This is a different conversation. This is a conversation that that's taking us outside of the traditional boundaries of the system." And I think that for, for black people in this country, I think that's important, you know, and, and, and it, it, for you, Alicia, as a woman who's bringing all of these wonderful black minds, these wonderful women of color to come together, mm-hmm. is this a, this about us becoming capitalists in, in black face? And here's, and here's why I'm asking that question, mm-hmm. because I see that quite often mm-hmm. we get mad about capitalism as is expressed by white people in this country mm-hmm. because we don't get we are not the recipients of that mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. we're the burdens of uh, and, the, and we're the burden bearers of that right mm-hmm. um but then when i hear black folks talking about we need to get money we need to build wealth it's like i'm not i don't want to build wealth so mm-hmm. i could be a capitalist quote unquote mm-hmm. right or, or just somebody that's like oh i just want to get money and then I'm out of my, my 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 current state so I can live high on a hog, sit on top of the hill and talk mm-hmm. about the greatness of my business and my my wealth. Mm-hmm. There has to be a whole different model of how we see wealth. And I'm glad that you brought up those books, you know, Healing Our Relationship with Wealth. I got to check that out and some of these other resources, because if we're going to talk about money, let's talk about it in the nature of who we are, that mm-hmm. by nature, we are a communal people. By nature, when we get when we when we eat, mm-hmm. somebody else is eating. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. By nature, we are setting up opportunities and and setting up uh, resources, and we are helping to build the community. It's nothing wrong with you getting money, mm-hmm. but when you become a hoard of the, you start hoarding all that money in for yourself and not. Mm-hmm. spreading the love as they say mm-hmm. now you become you know it, it it becomes a different conversation especially mm-hmm. for for us mm-hmm. so how, how do you how, what would you say is you know the best way to look at or what's the metric that we should use when we're talking about wealth building especially for black fe- black people so I, I you know often the conversation is wealth and impact and we really uh, knowing our history um for so many years now, I have a series of uh, slides that are like trivia about who, like Black women, the things that we've done in history. Um, uh, is it Poro College? Uh, my memory with the names, I'm just going to talk about the things when we build things, we build yes, things for community. You know, mm-hmm. this college that um, was used to teach women how to uh, sell hair products, do hair, how she encouraged everyone. Um, I'm trying to think of her name, everyone to, she gave incentives for them to purchase homes because she knew that them purchasing homes would set them up for future generations and how she was such a huge philanthropist giving away so much of her money. And so, uh, Annie Malone, and then I, uh, I, uh, um, the woman who was one of the first women in this country to start a bank. Um, and it was around seeing how poorly we were constantly being treated and um, how the institution 
really supported communities of color. Um, I think she also uh, created um, the way we were being treated when we went to stores. So she created some strip malls and just like it was all community, community, community and how philanthropy giving back. Uh, um, the woman who uh, was one of the few women a part of the Colorado gold rush, how like she scrubbed, uh, she was like took care of the men's dirty clothes and everything and mm. through her laundry service, she bought gold mines and then the how she helped free slaves and then um, created a church and created organizations. And again, huge philanthropists. I could actually go on and on mm. uh, um, all of the a woman in California about when we just to have the spirit of our community and impact when we understand our history first of all, and like how powerful we are and that when, how we use our wealth to have impact for our community. So I'm in a wealth and impact conversation. I love it. Because when we all do, when we do better, we encourage others in our community to do better and we'll all do better. We'll have no the doubt. power that we don't have right now. All, it, it, is a, it is a community effort here. And so, and, and, yeah. And, and Alicia, I have to say, you know, we got a few moments left, but I have to say that, you know, individuals like you, uh, when I listen to my sister, Deborah Owens from Get Wealthy, she has a show here on Black Star Network. Mm -hmm. When I listen to Black women in particular talking about building wealth, do, doing what we can to 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 build the wealth, to create the impact in that we want to we want to see. It's like we need y'all at the table to create a different economic paradigm. I'm, I'm, and I'm being, I'm being ultra serious and super real about this, Alicia. Mm -hmm. We need a different economic paradigm in this country because I'm personally tired of, you know, from the small things to concert tickets to the big things of the, 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 the national debt. You know what I'm saying? Like, the way the relationship that we have with money in this country is so influenced by white supremacy is so influenced by you know our inferiority is so influenced by seeing people as just uh as as just pieces of a machine versus <laughs> seeing them for the full investment of their potential and their talent we really we need an economic paradigm shift in this country and i i can tell from you from other women and, and other men mm -hmm. it's right there mm -hmm. like we're right there absolutely you know absolutely. what i'm saying like like and you and i love what you're saying mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this is the greatest period because we talk about we talk about um we often talk about politics on this show and in our spaces and it's like, at what point mm -hmm. do you just say enough is enough, mm -hmm. walk on faith, mm -hmm. and you start to build a different path to economic freedom? What point do you start to, to say, you know what, mm -hmm. I'm going to reject the way that this system has taught me to, to handle money? Mm -hmm. I'm going to reject how the relationship that I've had with money based mm -hmm. upon failed thinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I'm mm -hmm. going to reject all of this. Like, I just, I'm ready for something new. I know my crew is ready for something new. We already, we're yearning, Alicia, for something new. <laughs> Absolutely. Now is the time. We can build organizations like never before. I am partnering with some women from the, my journey to wealth, women in action community. And we're starting an organization called uh, the Disruptor DAO. Uh, a DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization. It is the future of how we're gonna organize ourselves. And I always say, we're not entering this game at the 11th hour. This is the new way that we're gonna be, that organizations are organizing themselves, creating ecosystems, with yes. a cooperative economics right. perspective right. and uh, building a community 
of people and businesses and services and um, industries in a way that we haven't thought about before because it's possible. Technology is actually making a lot of things really possible right now. Right. And so to just play and dreaming big a, a, a little more and seeing the potential for us to really shape our world in ways that we never thought that we could before. Absolutely. It's possible now. Absolutely. Yes. I love it. I mm -hmm. love it. All right, Alicia, we got like a minute or so left. How can people sign up for this uh, free five-day challenge you got, Seducing Abundance? I love it. You got to seduce abundance. Yes. Come here, abundance. Get your <laughs> fine self over here. <laughs> so it's actually seducingabundance.com. Yeah, it's a free five-day event. If you wanted to, you can, for a nominal cost, you can purchase the re replays, but it is a free five-day event. You will hear some amazing like-minded women talking about all of the ways that we can start to shape our thinking so that we're building wealth. Hold and on, and, and I'm gonna, oh, let me just say, and Ke and Keenan, just scroll back down. I want people to see the full, look at the look at the, the ladies that you got here, the, the expert panel here. I mean, I'm just, this got Hazel and Nicole and Shawnee and Lisa. Oh my gosh. Come on now, this is, this is, this is heavy right now. Yes, yes, we, yes, it's, we have to do this ladies. We all have to do this, but we know when women in a community are strong, like there's something that it does to the whole community. There's something that it does for our children. And when we're powerful from an abundance and wealth perspective, because remember, like in, in this culture, you're usually uh, either a consumer where, you, where every resource that is coming in is building other people's wealth or you're an investor where the resources that are coming in are able to build the wealth that you need to have the impact that you want in your life, your family life, your right. community, and the things that are important to you. So there's a lot that we receive that encourages us to just be consumers. And all that is doing, every dollar that comes in when you're a consumer, it's just all going out. It's all building other people's wealth. And so it's a shift, a mindset shift again, for you to see yourself as an investor, to see yourself with abundance, building wealth, and having impact. That is. That is. And the website, again, is seducingabundance.com, correct? Yes, that is it. Seducing. And, and look, I love, when you're talking about seeing yourself from a consumer to an investor, the first thing that came to my mind, Alicia, is like you can either see yourself at the table Mm -hmm. Or on the menu. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. We, do we either got a seat at the table or somebody's eating you up, bro? <laughs> you are it's on the true. menu. Your it interest is. is being eaten up or you on the menu. Yes. My sister, Alicia Holmes, the wealth whisperer. Yes. I it appreciate is always you. great. Thank you for what you do. Thank oh, you. Well, anytime, anytime. Uh, again, <laughs> folks. This is the Wealth Whisperer, Alicia Holmes. She's doing a fantastic job trying to get us in our to, uh, to financial freedom, not just in, in, in terms of money, but also in mindset. And make sure y'all check out seducingabundance.com on your journey to wealth, a five-day, a free five-day challenge to propel women of color into a world of self-discovery and financial freedom. Awesome, awesome lineup, expert panel of dynamic women that can talk about taking everything that you're doing in your life to the next level. Folks, don't be on the menu. <laughs> Just be at the table. Alicia, thank you so much for being so good for the culture. I truly appreciate you. And certainly we'll bring you back on. Okay. Thank you so much. It's always absolutely. Good absolutely. <laughs> thank Folks, we got to take a quick pause. When we come forward, we're going to check in with Dr. Larry Walker to talk about... Um, this situation that the, that, that the White House is doing, they're going to be hosting a screening of the movie Till. And we're going to talk about the significance of that, especially in a post-Obama era. Stay with us. That conversation is up next here on The Culture on the Black Star Network. talk about blackness 
and what happens in black culture. We are about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash. 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Black Star Network is here. Oh, no punch! It's a real um, revolutionary right now. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America. All the momentum we have now. We have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene. A white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. Oh, that's so White people are losing their damn minds. It's an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Folks, welcome back to the culture here on the Black Star Network. For our final conversation, I wanted to have a discussion about something that's going to be happening at the White House tomorrow, where the Biden administration will be hosting a special screening of the movie Till. Now, this was the movie that came out last year, in December of last year, talking about the story of Mamie Till, the mother of uh, Emmett Till, talking about her side of the story as to what she had to endure and what the decisions she had to make. Um, uh, as it relates to the great tragedy of that brutal beating and killing of her son, Emmett Till. And even though the movie was snubbed uh, for Oscar consideration, uh, many people found that movie to be very helpful in telling that part of our history. Now, the president has been vocal about um, his take on racial issues, right? And he has even gone as far as to sign the Anti-Lynching Act last year in the name of Emmett Till. So I wanted to have a conversation about the cultural significance of the president having a special screening like this, because, you know, I can't stop thinking about what my brother said yesterday, uh, Dr. Jason Nichols, who said that this president was the most progressive president that he has seen in his lifetime, a young black man saying that. And I'm wondering, is he on to something? Let me welcome now Dr. Larry, Larry J. Walker. Dr. Walker, you, you've been who's been seen on RMU uh, and here to give us some insight as to what we're seeing right now with Biden and race in this country. Doc, good to talk to you, brother. How are you this afternoon? I'm good, brother. Thanks for having me. 
Absolutely. What What do you make of this? Um, and I and I quoted my brother, Dr. Jason Nichols, saying that he, he really said it. He was like, yep, he Biden went from one end of the spectrum in some cases to this other end, you know, signing off on some of the most uh, racially justice uh, pieces of legislation. He's putting, you know, he's showing that he is growing in some ways, that he is progressive and far progressive than his predecessors. And now we got a showing of a movie about Emmett Till at the White House. I, I'm no shade to President Obama. <laughs> Obama wasn't doing that, huh? <laughs> I don't know if this is Joe Biden's way of saying, hey, Black people, I see you, uh, yeah. or what. But what do we make about this? This is pretty interesting, Doc. It is interesting. So I think you got to give credit. Look, I'm a former congressional staffer. And so Biden is what I've said to people. He's an institutionalist. And that's been part of some of the problems sometimes. Right. He's old school. He's been around for decades. And listen, he's more historically of a, he's a moderate Democrat, historically. But I got to agree with you 110%. He has really progressed a lot since, and I may argue, obviously, even when he was running for president in terms of what he said he was going to name as a black woman which he did, um, he would and then select a black woman to be the first su Supreme Court justice. And then obviously she was confirmed by the U.S. Senate. So, but Joe Biden really is, um, he, he had surprised me. I'd be, I'd have to be frank with you. And I think that that was something as important is the role of black women. Right. This is critical. And I think people don't give VP Harris enough credit. First of all, the job of the VP is to kind of be in the background, but while she's in the background, she's still advising him and giving him feedback. And so, what does this signify in terms of the White House having showing till tomorrow night? This is going to amplify the movie. And you talked about it. I agree with you, obviously, in terms of Oscar snubs. And to be frank, as Black folks, we're used to this every year. being <laughs> snub for movies that are historically accurate and talk about tragic issues. But the fact that he's having this at the White House will mean the New York Times, CNN, MSC, Fox, everyone else is going to cover it to some extent. And once again, it goes to the point about amplifying his tragic murder and the fact in terms of what even happened in terms of the trial, but remembering also in terms of what we see in the continuous murder of killing of black men at the hands of law enforcement. And yeah. also we continue to see these videos of black folks being, you know, being, you know, profiled by, you know, Tom, Dick and Harry walking down the street and black folks are looking at birds or in their house or, you know, or order McDonald's or whatever else we do in the black folks that, that, that people always see have a problem with. So I would say he's come a long way on issues like this. He has come a long way. Now, here's the thing, Doc. My thinking is, how do we as the constituents, I mean, you, you, you worked in administrations, congressional staffers, you understand the dynamics of, of putting something out there to the public and the impact that it has coming back in. Um, but for the constituents, what, what are the, the proper metrics that we should use or can use to determine whether something is political theater performative versus if it's legitimate. So let, let's be clear, because I work for a politician or a politician thinks you're right. This is political. <laughs> <laughs> anytime, anytime you screen a Black film at the White House, especially a Black film that is the murder of a Black child, it is without it, I, it, without a, it, it is political. And let's keep in mind that we have an election coming up next year. And also, he needs the black vote, particularly, like I said, we already know what the numbers are in terms of how black women come out. But this is political theater, but is a political theater for a purpose. Now, listen, he could have, you know, there are a number of movies he could have, he could have screened, but what it allows him to do is connect um, policy and purpose. So he signed anti-lynching law in the name of Emmett Till, which I want to highlight that Rand Paul held up for a long time. I just want to highlight that because it's really important to talk about that. But the fact that he actually signed legislation puts the connects policy and purpose. So the policy was signing the bill. The purpose is we're amplifying it at the White House, having this event, we're inviting all these people, and then I'm gonna talk about it. And then so as he, over the next couple of months, as he's running for president and he goes into black communities, he can say I'm the first president to sign this legislation right. policy. And then the purpose is I amplified it at the White House. So do do we do we play a role in 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 making things political? Because when the president does, and I'm saying any president, right? But let's let's use Biden as an example. Anytime the president does something for another group of people, and then we it comes back to us, we're like, well, what about us, right? So we kind of put him in a space where 
it need it has to be political, right? Like it has to be a big deal when he does something for black people. Is that is that is that our fault? No, because that's the nature of politics. And, and especially for those who, you know, you know, like myself, you know, with others who live in within the beltway, right? This is this is this is how the game goes. And so for, for black folks, we're also in terms of other when it comes to other eight racial ethnic groups, we're constantly putting the, the foot on the pedal and we're constantly holding folks accountable. So listen, why you know President Biden has done a lot of great things in terms of, you know, um nominating a number of more than any other president, black women to federal benches. There are times that we feel like we need to hold him accountable. We think he's not doing what's necessary because once again, black folks help to help them get elected, particularly in states like Georgia's and other Pennsylvania, my home state, et cetera. So, you know, yeah, we do we make it political? We have to because our lives are on the line. Let's be clear. Like right. this N.A. Lynch bill is in the name of a black boy that was murdered. So right. black folks have to constantly um, pressure policymakers particularly when we talk, like, you know, I'm a former congressional staffer of the CB, and I work for a CBC member. Particularly when we talk about the role of the CBC in maybe not pressuring necessarily publicly, but give them a call, someone like Clyburn, give them a call and saying, look, Joe, I think you need to do this. Right, right. Now, how do you foresee this situation around the George Floyd Justice for Policing Act to go? Now there's been talk about it. And I mean, I've had some voices on this show, Dr. Walker, where they're like, man, that's just a bunch of fluff. It doesn't still get to the heart of the matter where you have local and state police departments that are really going to uh, implement some of these important changes that's going to lead to better relationship between the Black community and the police department. Do you think that this should, we should be hanging our hat on this particular bill? So this, the George Floyd bill is, is critically important. It's not going to become law for the next anytime soon, at least not until we see what happens in 2024 Damn. with the House. So, Damn. I mean, let's, 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 let's be clear. Republicans are not supporting the George Floyd Policing Act. They're not. And to be frank, the bill should have should have been law prior to them, you know, taking the House. But we can talk about all the antics in, in, the, in the Senate. We like to it in a, maybe another conversation. But it's just not going to happen. The Republicans are not going to support it. And you see, if you look at, you know, not even McCarthy, but. Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene and some of these other uh, right wingers just criticizing. They're talking about the Black National Anthem. I mean, you think they talk about the Black National Anthem? You think they're talking about comprehensive police reform? It is not happening from a policy standpoint. It doesn't mean the Biden administration can't continue to apply pressure. And as he gets as he, he gets out more in public and the campaign trail, can't talk about that. I support this legislation, but the folks in the in the in the, in the House won't support it. And we need to get remove them. Have Democrats take it back to the House in 2024. Hold on to the Senate reelect me as president and let's get this done. So the reason I brought that up, Doc, is just because, you know, the same way that we saw our little brother Emmett Till being brutally murdered, you know, we're, we're seeing, we're still kind of seeing that pattern, that behavior now in 2023, of course, with Tyree Nichols, you know, that's at the hands of other black men. I'm, I'm wondering like, okay, so where's the change? Where's the light at the end of this tunnel? So, you know, I write about this in my research, a lot about racism, but we got to talk about white supremacy. And I know you talk about that on your show. Yeah. And we talk about even the recent murder in Tennessee and obviously at the hands of, of several black men, they bought into white supremacy. And so that we have to kind of, we have to be able to have the kind of contextualize, have these conversations about how white supremacy and anti-blackness play out even in, you know, well, white supremacy, certainly anti-blackness can play out in the black community because there are folks in our own community who view other black folks as less than, I think what you saw in Tennessee, the murder in Tennessee highlights that. But once again, we have to find ways to dismantle white supremacy overall. Is this president, the president that, that that's gonna take us to the next level? 2024 is next, is around the corner. So, you know, we've been having conversations like what do we, what do black America do uh, if, if, you know, the Democratic Party said, you know, 2024, Biden is gonna be our guy. We don't know who the Republican may be, maybe Trump and maybe DeSantis, we don't know. Do we care? Um, but it's 2024. That that's a big that's a big moment for for Black America to make a very big decision. Which way do we go? Yeah, it is. But let's be clear: we don't want to vote for anyone who 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 espouses you know anti-black you know slogans or you know, wants true, to true, doesn't true. want doesn't want Black folks talking about Black history. Doesn't want Black folks talking about anything related to our history from now going back to 1619. So 
and Joe, let's be clear, Joe Biden, and like I said, I, I, more than anyone else, I've certainly the points I've offered critiques, but he's been far more progressive on some issues that, that I would have been, ever anticipated for someone, like I said, I describe him as, as an institution that's been around for years. You got to give him credit when credit is due. He's going to go down the history as the first president to get a black woman confirmed to the U.S. Senate. That is historical in nature. And look, as we move to, you know, to next year in, in the election, he's, there's not much else he's going to get done, particularly when it comes to issues relating to civil rights to impact black folks. Because like I said earlier, Republicans in the House are just not going to have that. But also highlights for black folks why we need to get out in 2024. Because on the other side, you do not want some right winger, radical right winger in the White House. Because we already see what happens when it happens. I mean, what happens in terms of not only in terms of black, the violence against black folks, um, Asian Pacific Islander communities, the Latinx community, et cetera. So we don't want anyone else in the White House who's going to be espousing all these anti-black policies, which led to the January 6th insurrection. Absolutely. Absolutely. Dr. Larry J. Walker, who is an assistant, assistant professor at the University of Central Florida. Doc, we got to have you back on more times, brother, but I truly appreciate your analysis in this because uh, um, I feel like, you know, even with the president show and tell, there's still a lot of ground to cover. Um, and, and you know, with that recent move of uh, making the uh, presidential primaries, South Carolina being the first stop of the presidential primaries, I mean, what Biden doing? I see what he's trying to do. He's trying, he trying to position black folks to get a little bit more piece of the pie, but we will have to see. You know what I mean? For me, the jury is still out, but I, 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 you, to, to your point, you got to give credit to credit where credit is due. And he's 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 moving in a direction. Now, whether he's going to become the president for the next four years or somebody else on the Democratic ticket, that's going to be that's going to be the real test of time. But we will have to see. Dr. Larry Walker, thank you so much, brother, for joining me here on The Culture. Thanks for having me, bro. Absolutely. Folks, we got to uh, wrap up. That's it for us. I want to thank all of my, my voices here. I want to thank Alicia Holmes, Dr. Walker. I want to thank my team, Keenan, Joel, my control wall. And I want to thank you. Thank you so much. Make sure, folks, that y'all do your due diligence. Make sure y'all check us out on BlackStarNetwork.com. Um, and uh, we are doing some phenomenal things that, you know, Brother Roland has been out and about taking care of the business. Um, and, and we have created shows and platforms. I mean, we're just getting higher and higher. And so your support means everything to us. Go to BlackStarNetwork.com today. Uh, you can give financially to continue to support this movement. And you can also share the content. You say, I don't have any money to give, but I can certainly share the content. I can subscribe. I can tell my family and friends to subscribe. I can download the app for free. Let's do it all. Let's do it all. And let's keep pushing the envelope and certainly the conversations that impact us. So go to BlackStarNetwork.com. Also follow us on all social media at Blackstar Network on IG and Twitter as well. And while you're there, also follow me. Hit me up at Faraji Muhammad. I'm Faraji on Twitter, the real Faraji on IG. I would love to love, love, love to connect with you and uh, let's continue to build. And also, folks, if you did not know, Black Star Network is now on Amazon News. So if you have a Fire TV and you want to look for some great cultural conversations about news and information, go ahead. Just tell Alexa to play Black Star News, Black Star Network, and boom, here we come up. My face will come up. Roland's face will come up. Deborah Owens' face will pop up. You know what I'm saying? Tech Life Steph will, will come up. Man, everybody will come up. But that's what we're doing right now. And we are continuing to grow in so many places. So continue to support us. That's going to do it for us today, folks. I thank each and every one of you for tuning in and being a part of the conversation. Stay tuned. Up next is Roland Martin Unfiltered. As always, never be afraid to challenge what's wrong. Stand for what's right while being yourself in the process. And uh, I will say that, God willing, next week, as we talk about Till, next week we're going to have the producer of Till joining us here on The Culture. So you can expect some great, great discussions with him uh, and, and with the team of Till. So that's coming up next week. God willing, we'll talk tomorrow for another exciting edition of The Culture right here on the Black Star Network. Thank you for tuning in. Have a great afternoon and evening. Peace.